This episode of the Creep Street Podcast is brought to you by Martini Coffee Roasters. You know, people always look at me weird when I say I start off every morning with a big old martini. But then I set them straight and I tell them I'm talking about Martini Coffee Roasters coffee. A delicious coffee made by the Martini family. They roast their coffee using a traditional method of sight and sound to roast those little babies to perfection. And they also sell green coffee beans for those home roasters out there. And right now, fans of the Creep Street podcast can get 20% off their entire order by using the code CREEPSTREET at martinicoffee.com. Once again, for 20% off your order, use the code CREEPSTREET at martinicoffee.com. Martini Coffee Roasters, the perfect coffee to keep you creeps caffeinated. You've taken a wrong turn. Down Creep Street. Citizens of the Milky Way, this is Maureen Bogey. And this is Dylan Hackworth. And you are listening to the Creep Street Podcast. Oh, yeah, baby, baby, that's right. That is very cool. We are so gosh darn happy to have you here today. We are in for a freaking treat. So if you are already a fan of the podcast, yes. we implore you to to please leave a like, a rate, subscribe, tell your friends about us, you know, all that good stuff. And if you want some more Creep Street content, if you're needing a little bit of a little bit extra. Oh, we know you are. Yeah. You can go over to patreon.com slash creepstreetpodcast and there you can get just access to the just absolutely cuckoo crazy wild silly but still serious and cutting journalism oh Oh, yeah oh yeah we have three different tiers we've got all sorts of stuff whatever works for you yes yes yeah once again that is at patreon.com slash creep street podcast always remember we got merch over at creepstreetpodcast.com slash store Mm. and dylan what is going on today what are we in for oh well we are headed over to europe today ever heard of it Oh, uh, yes. Now, I, I correct me if I'm wrong, Okay. Uh, but this may be our first episode that is based on a subject in Spain. Is it? I think so, right? I don't think we've really had a, like, at least where Spain was, like, the main, yeah. you know, situation, I think. It may have popped up in various episodes, but right. I think this might be the first time an episode is solely dedicated to Spain. Well, España, you know, bienvenidos a la, or el, Creep Street. Okay. <laughs> that was good Spanish. <laughs> yes, it was. I said, Spain, welcome to Creep Street. Because I said it weird. And I think I said Allah, which is actually French. Oh. Well, I mean, Allah is God. But, it, you know, it, we're, that's neither here nor there. Dylan, what's going on? Folks, pull down the blinds. Lock the doors. Mm. We are getting spooky today. Yeah. Today's episode is Cursed Spanish Ghost Towns. Let me give you goosebumps with my sources here. Okay. First, we got, of course, a Brent Swanser joint. Mm. A journey through the mystical, cursed villages of Spain by Brent Swanser at Mysterious Universe. Incredible. La Musara by Pelo Plata at Atlas Obscura. Ocate, Abandoned Door to Another World by Karen Laranaga at KarenLaranaga.com. Spain's Cursed Village of Witches by Inca Cuiso at BBC.com. The Ruins of Belcate by Nicoli Siacchio at Atlas Obscura. Mysterious and Haunted Places in Spain by Anna at LifestylesCrossroads.com. Carmona 
The Most Charming Town of the Dead by Justine Anchetta at Latitude41.com. And I'm sure I mispronounced some names. I am very, very sorry. Mm-hmm. And of course, being that this takes place in Spain, if, if there's any words or names I mispronounce, of course, as we always say, very, very sorry. Yes. We mean no disrespect. We just, you know, I, I, I just mispronounced it. Mm, exactly. But let's get end of this. Okay. This week we are talking about ghost towns, specifically ghost towns in Spain. Now, yes. we're all probably familiar with the concept of a ghost town. Mm-hmm. It really has nothing to do with ghosts. It's just when a town is essentially abandoned for whatever reason. Mm-hmm. For example, there's many ghost towns in the American West from back during the early railroad days and from the gold rush. Yeah. When a train would stop coming to a town, usually businesses and people had to move elsewhere. But sometimes a ghost town can literally mean a town of ghosts. Yeah. Yeah. A place where people fear to tread, and that is exactly what we are talking about today. A handful of Spanish ghost towns. Okay. So let's start with La Musara. (gasps) Now this supposedly cursed village lies in the Tarragona Mountains of northern Spain, and my sources describe this area as being, of course, quite beautiful. The place was once a busy little spot, but that would all change in the 1960s when the local vineyards began to die off from disease and were replaced by dense weeds. Mm, Okay. The locals there, of course, relied on these vineyards as a way of life, so when people left the place, they did so very quickly. And while the dying vineyards was given as the official reason for everyone leaving, there has, of course, long been rumors that there were far darker reasons for the quick departure. Many believe that the area is within the clutches of sinister paranormal forces. It's always been rumored that nothing will grow in this area, as if the land itself is cursed. And it's true that since the town was abandoned and the vineyards all died, that nothing has really grown there since, nothing of consequence. But perhaps the freakiest legend is that the ghost village of La Masara is haunted by a sort of paranormal fog that spreads across the land. It's believed that within this fog is a portal to another dimension, and that anyone unfortunate enough to get lost in this fog are never seen again. Mm. But perhaps what is more terrifying is what might be coming through the portal into our dimension. Many have reported seeing strange, shadowy figures looming in the fog. Folks will also hear strange and haunting noises, such as wailing and even screaming. Apparently, there have been a disproportionate amount of disappearances in the area as well that are still unexplained. It was a disappearance in 1991 that really solidified the reputation of La Masara as a place that you just don't want to go. Mm -hmm. Enrique Martinez Ortiz was a 27-year-old man, and he was out with some friends on a lovely day picking mushrooms. Enrique trailed behind the group for only a few minutes, and when his pals turned around, Enrique was nowhere to be seen. Police and search parties would sweep the area, but no sign of him was ever seen again. How could someone vanish without a trace when their friends had only taken their eyes off of him for mere moments? Right. And it's not like this is a bustling city. Mm -hmm. This is a a little abandoned village. Right, right. They didn't hear him yell. They -hmm. didn't hear the sound of him running like he quickly ran off. Yeah. He was just gone. Right. In addition to the fog and the disappearances, hikers and other folks in the area will often report the sudden feeling of being disoriented. Mm. And even stranger, a sudden loss of time. Wow. Which The yeah. loss of time, yeah. We see that so much. And oh, yes. that really, I think, is just so creepy. Oof, weird. Oh, yes. And we'll get into that a little bit deeper here because I think, you know, it ties back into sort of things like time slips and all this stuff. Yeah. And I think it has to do with this fog. And I will discuss that, like I said, in just a bit. But aside from people in the area feeling disoriented, compasses and electrical equipment will also malfunction, they say. And even on top of all of this, the place is said to be a hot spot for UFO sightings. People who dare visit the town, even if the fog is not there at the time, will have 
strange experiences. They often report the church bell ringing even though it hasn't been in working order in decades. People will hear voices coming from the abandoned buildings. A musician named Carlos Ribot had a weird experience there, and this is what he said happened. I went with my girlfriend one night. We stayed in the refuge close to the village. At midnight, we heard strange noises like horses neighing, but we knew there were no horses nearby. Before we went to La Musara, we didn't believe that paranormal things were real. Now we are not so sure. Hmm. And, as if that were not enough, it's said that the local cemetery is also a hot spot for spooky stuff as well. Yeah. The graveyard is said to be haunted by the ghosts of witches. <gasps> and that the woods that surround the place harbor evil fairies and gnomes. Oh. The place really is a melting pot for all sorts of creepy phenomena. Interesting. So yeah, it's just like this area, area, if if I may, is one of those places where it's just all sorts of types of things are going yes. on. Very much a skinwalker ranch or that sort of thing where it's just a melting pot of all sorts of strange phenomena. Mm -hmm. Now, before we move on to other haunted ghost towns, I want to briefly talk about electronic fog because that's something that's going to get its own episode. It's believed mm. it's played a role in various disappearances. For example, a very popular one is Amelia Earhart. Yeah. So, because I wanted to give everyone a kind of a general understanding of it, but didn't want to spend too much time on it, I had good old chat GPT whip oh. up a short description, an overview, if you will, of electronic fog. Now, just so, so you know, we don't use AI to make our episodes, oh. of, obviously, but I just wanted to, I had it write up a, an overview of electronic fog, so it just kind of gives you an idea, and then, of course, we will cover it in depth in its own episode. Oh, yeah. But here's an overview of electronic fog. Electronic fog is a hypothetical phenomenon often associated with unexplained disappearances and mysterious events, particularly in regions like the Bermuda Triangle. The term was popularized by pilot and author Bruce Gernon, who claimed to have encountered this phenomenon while flying through the Bermuda Triangle. Described as a dense, grayish cloud with unusual electromagnetic properties that can interfere with aircraft and ship instruments. Characteristics of electronic fog, it appears as a thick, swirling gray or whitish fog, often described as having electronic or technological appearances, sometimes with visible lines or patterns within the fog. It moves in a way that seems unnatural compared to regular weather phenomena. It can appear suddenly and envelop an area or vehicle very quickly, and it's reported to follow or surround vehicles, sometimes creating funnel-like structures around them. Navigation and instruments may malfunction or give false readings while in the fog. Compass needles spin erratically or become frozen in place. GPS devices may lose signal or provide incorrect locations. Aircraft and ships have reported losing radio contact with control centers. Pilots and sailors report experiencing time distortions where they cover distances much faster than physically possible. Some accounts describe a sensation of being in a time warp or experiencing a loss of time altogether. Witnesses often feel disorientated and a distorted sense of direction and distance. Bruce Gernon, in December 1970, he and his co-pilot encountered an electronic fog while flying from Andros Island to Palm Beach, Florida. They described seeing a tunnel form in the fog, which they flew through, experiencing severe instrument malfunction and a sense of time loss. Gernon claims they traveled 100 miles in about 30 minutes, a journey that should have taken much longer. Numerous anecdotal accounts from pilots, sailors, and ship captains reporting similar experiences in the Bermuda Triangle and other mysterious locations have been made. Some cases involve unexplained disappearances where no wreckage or survivors are found, often attributed to the effects of electronic fog. But anyway, so that is an overview of electronic fog. Okay, yeah, because I don't know if I ever even really knew if there was like you know, a specific term for this. Or, or maybe I did know this at some point and I, you know, have kind of forgotten. But yeah, that this phenomena of the fog that, like, either people disappear within it or whatever. Like, right. You know, I just didn't realize it had a name. 
there you go. Yes, exactly, exactly. Well, let's move on to our next ghost town. Yes, but I am excited, though, for when we uh, come back to that and we talk a little bit more about that electric fog. Absolutely, so am I. But anyway, yes, we're moving forward. Now let's talk about the ghost town of Okate, located in the province of Burgos in the district of Condado de Trevino. This place was once a booming town given its location along a busy trade route along the Bay of Biscayne and the wine fields of La Rioja. But beginning in 1860, the place began to be hit by a series of unfortunate events. Mm -hmm. The town was hit first by some sort of epidemic illness and it killed many. But more strange illnesses would come and what was weird was these illnesses only seemed to affect this one little town, not any of the like other villages and stuff nearby. Mm -hmm. In a matter of only 10 years, this small town was hit with three of these mysterious illnesses. On top of that, famine destroyed their crops. But then the small town was rocked by a very grotesque and mysterious murder. After this, the town was abandoned by those who still remained, and to this day, what remains of the little village is a church tower and the rubble of some of the buildings that were there. Now, there's a ton of paranormal stuff that has been reported in and around this abandoned ghost town. Right. Everything from ghosts walking amongst the ruins strange lights and orbs to UFOs in the sky. Mm -hmm. Also strange voices of women and children that call out to those nearby. Yeah, interesting. The place is visited frequently by paranormal investigators. One such investigator is a person named Iker Jimenez, and this is what they had to say about the place. I have to recognize that with night having fallen over us, I was shaken to my bones when I heard those recorded voices from Okate from January and June of 1987. The first was the scream of a little girl saying, Pandora, or maybe the voice was yelling, Campora, which in Basque means get out. This voice was recorded inside of the bell tower and with total clarity that it was truly chilling. There was another voice recorded in the same place but higher up and has left in the air various questions. This last voice was that of a woman who, in a lamentable and hoarse tone, said, Why is the door still open? But the legends of this place only continue. The church that stood there is the Church of San Miguel. It's said that in 1947 the church bell tower was struck by lightning And when it happened, there suddenly appeared a medallion depicting a female form. But what's strange is that this bell tower is said to be struck by lightning often, even on bright and sunny days. Just like La Musara, it's believed that Akate also has a portal somewhere hidden within it to another dimension. Mm. It's said that many people have just simply gone missing in the area of the ghost town with no trace of where they went. One of the very first disappearances is said to have happened way back in 1868. A local priest there at the church, a man named Antonio, is said to have vanished in broad daylight. Like someone just turned around and he was gone. Oh, that's so weird. It's like the leftovers. Yes, exactly. Then again, in the 1970s, it's said that a farmer who was passing through the area also just simply vanished. And the list of missing persons associated with the tiny abandoned village goes on and on. And also, just like La Musara, the place has become a popular destination for paranormal researchers. One such investigator was a man named Alberto Fernandez. Now this is very dark, just so everyone knows. Mm -hmm. When investigating Okate in August of 1987, Alberto suddenly and without warning took his own life. It's said that many who visit this ghost town have the overwhelming urge to harm themselves, and if not themselves, others around them. Hmm. And of course, the place is linked to many UFO sightings. One of the most famous UFO incidents there happened to a man named Angel Rosine in August of 1978. He claimed to have witnessed a bright white light rising out of Okate, and suddenly it broke off into three separate lights. Understandably freaked out, 
Angel ran to his shed and hid. And from the shed, he watched the lights speed off and disappear into the mountains. A man named Mikel Colmenero had a very weird UFO experience there also in 1987 when he saw a UFO hovering in the sky over the town. But that was when he noticed two alien-like beings on the ground. He described them as tall, maybe about 10 feet tall, and dressed in black. Men in black, maybe? Weird, but they said like 10 feet tall? Yes, yes. Huh, well that's a little strange because... Men in black, even though something seems off about them, I've never heard of them being that tall that they would be, like, completely noticeable. Right, right. Yeah, it's very strange. Very strange indeed. Mm. Now, he didn't say, like, black suits. He just, just, well, he said black suits, but it doesn't necessarily mean, like, a... That could mean Like a typical things. men's, like, formal wear or right, something, right, you, right. you know? A very famous photo of a UFO hovering over Akate was published in the Spanish paranormal magazine Mundo Desconocido, which translates to Unknown World. The photo was taken by a person named Prudencio Muguruza, a bank employee who just happened to be in the area that day. And this man would also publish a book about the abandoned town in 2014. And in this book, he claimed that extraterrestrials had actually been stranded nearby the town way back in the 13th century and that they have lived in and around the village ever since. In the book, he also claimed that alien bodies have been buried in the various cemeteries in the surrounding areas. He even claimed that these ETs battled with the Knights Templar back in the Middle Ages. Now, just for the sake of thoroughness, my source does say that there are no historical records of mysterious illnesses that wiped out the town in the 19th century, nor are there any record of any strange missing persons cases associated with the village, just for thoroughness. Now, our next stop is at the ghost town known as Tresmaz. You can find what remains of this town in the province of Zaragoza, in Aragon, in the Moncayo mountain range. Mm -hmm. And this place actually has seen some very interesting history that isn't even paranormal. The place's history dates back to the 12th century, and the area was once ruled over by the king of Aragon, Jaime I, and then it was involved in a civil war with the nearby Verula Abbey, which we'll get into, boy oh boy. Mm. And it was also the temporary home of a man named Manuel Yason Coronas, the inventor of the mop and bucket. Oh, well, shout out. Thanks, thanks, you know, thanks. Pretty much Silicon Valley there. Yeah, for real, my God. Now, unlike the first two places we've covered, this town has not been fully abandoned with a current population estimated to be around 96 people. But it's said that at some point in its history, the place was home to around 10,000 people. Whoa. So quite a drastic drop there. Yeah. And while driving by the place, one might think it's just an unassuming village. It's said to be home to evil witches, black magic, and evil pagan practices. Oh. Most of the sinister rumors associated with the place surround the castle of Trasmaz, which was built sometime during the 13th century. And the very, like, structure of the place, just the architecture of this castle, is very off-putting, very sinister. Mm. It's hexagonal shaped, and it's said that strange noises will emanate from the place, sounds such as rattling chains, banging noises, as well as screaming and wailing. Some folks even believe that the castle was assembled in a single night by a magician named Mutasion. Oh. Now, this was pretty interesting. Many think of these spooky rumors as actually being started by the folks who resided in the castle back at the time. Mm -hmm. There was some very rich silver and iron mines in the area, and it's believed that the castle was a place where crooks would make counterfeit coins. And so they encouraged the spooky rumors to keep the locals away. Very Scooby-Doo. Very Scooby-Scooby-Doo. Right? Like, so Scooby-Doo. Where are you? But whether or not that's really how the rumors started, there may have been more weight to them than originally thought. 
Mm. The belief that the castle is home to warlocks and a coven of witches still persists to this day. Remember how we said that the place was involved in a civil war Mm -hmm. with the nearby uh, place called Verula Abbey? Well, because of all these spooky rumors, the monastery of Verula had the entire village excommunicated from the Catholic Church. Oh, that's tough. That's, that's, uh... Mm, maybe an overreaction. But it's also highly likely that the church held a bias towards the village as it was also home to many Muslims and Jews. So it's, you know, uh, of course, I'm sure that, yeah. y- you know, the, the Catholic church, I'm sure, yeah, you know, it uh, swayed their opinion a little bit, yeah, unfortunately. But mm. it apparently got so bad that Verula tried to divert the town's irrigation water without asking or paying for it. But King Ferdinand II, who was the king of Spain at the time, stopped this, and Tresmas was given their water rights. Verula was apparently so pissed about this, and they saw it as an insult to the church because it meant a a victory for these warlocks and witches. Mm. So many think that the church then put a curse on the village. Oh. It's said that after the church cursed the village, everything just fell apart. Diseases and famine ran rampant through the area. A fire burned down the castle in 1520. And there was, of course, a series of other just tragic events that just riddled the once 10,000-person population to only double-digit numbers. Mm. Even today, the village is very down on its luck. No pope since then has actually technically lifted the curse of the village. Oh, well, that, okay, let's... Let's hop to it. Daddy Francis. Yeah. Get in there, Papa. Now, naturally, with the town has never really been able to get its footing ever since, and it has made it, though, a tourist location in the modern area. That and, does rock, though, yeah. In fact, the town kind of leans into its reputation to a certain degree. Yeah, you got to. You have to. Every year, they host the Feria de Brujeria, a festival where folks come from all around to celebrate and buy and sell potions and amulets and have various kinds of fun. Mm. Every year they crown the Bruja de Año, a.k.a. the Witch of the Year. Hell yeah, this is fun. The, in fact, the Castle of Tremaz today houses a museum of witchcraft. <gasps> Wait, we so- have to go. Sounds like a fun destination. We have to go. I mean, goodness gracious, they turned it into Sedona, Arizona, for God's sake. I mean, sake. yeah. Or kind of, you know, I really, w- I, I want to say, uh, you know, Sleepy Hollow, New York, but they could, they could lean in harder. Right now, that's Salem, Salem is a town that's leaned is. into. It. There we go. Now, now, next we talk about the haunted village of Belquiete, located in the Zaragoza region of Spain. This place is known for its dark history and was once the site of a very bloody battle in the Spanish Civil War. Mm. In the summer of 1937, the village was the site of a 14-day standoff that saw over 5,000 people die, many of which were residents of the town. Oh. The place was essentially just a smoldering heap of rubble by the time the battle was over, and those who did survive abandoned the place. The ruins of the place still remain today, and if you happen to visit this ghost town, you will immediately get the sense that this place is haunted. Mm. When I read about the sort of things people experience here, it's very much the sort of thing you would hear like in Gettysburg, you know. Uh, uh, now, granted, the you know the Spanish Civil War was in the 1930s and mm-hmm. the American Civil War was in the 1860s, but very similar, which I'm sure many haunted sites that are were once the site of a of a battle, uh, you, you know, you would they say you often hear the sound of, of, of gunshots and marching soldiers and planes, bombs, wow. tanks, and of course the sounds of people shouting and screaming. Mm. People will often see shadow figures and spectral entities dressed in 1930s military uniforms. When visiting, people are often overwhelmed with a sense of dread that is so strong that some have ran from the village screaming. People will feel unseen hands on them. They'll often be pushed or hit. People have also reported the feeling that they've lost control over their own bodies, like someone else is at the wheel. Mm. One such incident was actually reported by a journalist named Carlos Bogdanich, who was there with a film crew filming an episode of a TV show called Fourth Dimension. 
He said that for hours, he and the crew had the sensation that their bodies were under the control of something else. It even got them to walk up to the top of the abandoned clock tower. While there, the crew also recorded numerous EVPs of voices and various sounds of battle. In this village, there are two churches and a mass grave called the Plaza de la Cruz, and these are said to be the most haunted locations there. Mm. It's also said that Belchiette was partly an inspiration for Guillermo del Toro's Pan's Labyrinth. Oh, okay. And here's what Bogdanich has said about this place. We went up the clock tower. We thought we'd go right to the top. The next day, when we saw what we had done, we couldn't believe it. We could have gotten ourselves killed, and still, something enticed us to do this. Mm. Now, our next Spanish ghost town is located in the province of Valencia, and it is called La Cornudilla. Now, whereas the previous towns lost their populations due to war and disease, it's said that La Cornudilla had an attack of intense paranormal activity that literally drove the citizens away. Yikes. Up until the 1950s, it was said that this was a thriving little town. Mm. But sometime during the 50s, people began to fear going out at night. Oh, God. Once the sun went down, it was said that the town was besieged by ghostly specters and the sounds of screaming and wailing, people shouting and crying and the sound of rattling chains. It's really not that bad. We live in Chicago. I, yeah, that's absolutely it's the really case. It's really not that serious. Just kidding. <laughs> Every night, once the sun was down, these phantom noises flooded through the town, but they could never find a source of the commotion. The people of the town were so freaked out by this, it said that they sent out for exorcists to come and cleanse the village of the specters that were plaguing it, but this did not work. Mm. It said that these ghostly noises went on for years until one day they just stopped. Stopped, that is, in all but one single house. For whatever reason, it was like the phenomenon just chose to dial in on this one house. So much so that the house earned the nickname, the House of Noise. Mm. The residents had had enough. By the late 1960s, La Cornudilla was completely abandoned. The place would fall into ruin as the years passed by, but it's said that the House of Noise stood until around 2016. Today, there is very little left to show that there was even a town there at all. However, some say the ghostly noises can still be heard when the sun goes down. There are many things folks tried to blame the haunting on. For one, the town itself, they said, was built over an ancient cemetery. Some even felt that UFOs were the cause of the strange noises, and some even blamed trolls. But to this day, no one knows for sure. Hmm... Very weird. These are, I just, I really want to check these places out. I know. This is just making me really want to go. I know. It's so interesting. Yeah. Wow. 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 Okay. Now, Mm. to wrap things up, we come to the town of Carmona. This was the site where in 1620, Dominican Franciscan monks built the monastery of Huerta de San Jose, but once built the place soon saw a series of tragedies. Now this gets dark. Oh no. And this is not what St. Joseph would have wanted. No, 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 no. San Jose, you understand. No, or the city of San Jose, California have wanted this either. I mean, for sure. You think the San Jose Sharks want this? Is there a San Jose, Texas? I'm sure there is. Just shout out to the San Jose's, all of them. I'm, I'm sure there's a few. But once built, Legend has it that one dark night, all but one of the monks at the monastery were brutally murdered. The remaining monk took all of the bodies to the cellar below the church that they used as a morgue. But according to the legend, once down there in the cellar, the remaining monk was confronted by the devil. And the devil started a fire that burned down most of the monastery. The next creepy incident would happen on November 25th in 1680. Now this was interesting. I guess the rooms that the monks would stay in were essentially like cells. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. And it was customary that at night, 
when a monk retired to their room, the cell door would be locked from the outside and it would be reopened at dawn the next morning. Well, on the morning of November 25th, 1680, a monk named Jaime Malvinas awoke to find their door had not been opened. But that's when he heard the sound of footsteps walking to his cell door. Thinking this was someone coming to open the door, the monk stepped back and waited. But as the footsteps approached, the monk was shocked when it sounded as though the footsteps walked right through the locked door Mm. and into his room. Then they stopped. The frightened monk held his breath in silence, listening for anything. And then, bang, the door flew open violently. Startled, the monk ran out of his room to find no one there. He went to the chapel, but also found no one. Eventually, the monk went to look in the cellars, and there he found a nightmarish scene. It's said that the monk found in the cellar the bodies of his dead fellow monks. Oh, God. Their bodies hung up on meat hooks. But Mm. that wasn't all. Circling the bodies of the dead were what the monk described as small beings, who were eating the flesh of the dead. What? According to the legend, these small beings told the monk that they were the devil and that they had spared his life so that he would tell the world of the devil's arrival. Now, I find it interesting that these small beings apparently collectively said they were the devil. Yeah, yeah, I was thinking that too. As if the devil, I guess, just split himself up into a handful of smaller beings. Right, I mean, he's, you know... I mean, it would. I mean, I. So who's to say he can't? I you mean, know, master I mean? of lies. I mean, he could. You know, he's doing all sorts of shit down there. For Christ's sake, literally. And notice that once again, only one monk was spared, just as in the first incident. Well, needless to say, Malvinus ran screaming out of the monastery and to the authorities. However, no one would believe what the monk was telling them, and it's said that he was even arrested and imprisoned. Yeah. It's said that during the burial ceremony for the deceased monks, the sky suddenly turned dark and two pillars of fire appeared. Between them, people saw the monstrous face of something demonic, an entity who had rodent-like features. There was a flash of lightning and thunder, and after that appeared another demonic figure, one that looked more human. Those that were there quickly took off running, screaming at the top of their lungs. The next day, it's said that a group of monks went to the location with their Bibles in hand in order to confront the devil and cast him away. It's said that an earthquake struck and the monks were tossed about like toys. That's when a booming voice came from out of nowhere saying, Perish everything and everyone. Now, as crazy as that sounds, this incident was actually recounted in an official church document signed by the Archbishop of Juarez at the time. And apparently there were numerous witnesses that corroborated the event. The monastery would continue to operate, but after that, the area was said to be absolutely infested with strange paranormal phenomenon. Mm. On top of that, there was constant disease and drought in the area that led many to think that the place had simply become cursed by the devil. But it wouldn't stop there. Another dark event would come just after the end of World War II. It's said that at the end of the 1940s, once again, a poor group of friars were found dead in the monastery's basement. Once again, their bodies were suspended on hooks. Oh, what? Get get rid of the fucking hooks. Get rid of the hooks. I guess guess why they had them was they said the, the monks there, that was where they would hang meat and they would cure meat. You know, that was like a place where they stored their meats. No, I understand, but I think we need to come up with a plan B. I know. I absolutely agree. You know what I mean? I think I know that, you know, monks, the whole thing is they have a routine and they do this, you know, the action and the activity and that's the whole thing. We got to pick a new thing. We got to get rid of the fucking hooks. Get rid of the hooks. When police arrived, they found one monk left alive, eyes wide with madness, crouching in a corner. He supposedly confessed to the murder, saying he was ordered by the devil to do it. The monastery was then abandoned shortly afterward, 
and to this day, folks often report strange phenomenon happening in the area. Many say that the spirits of all the murdered monks still reside there at the monastery. They appear as apparitions or as spheres of light. They can often be heard whispering. People report drastic drops in temperature and feelings of dread and strange noises constantly. The monastery of Huerta de San Jose is still a popular spot for paranormal enthusiasts to this very day. Yeah, I mean, I don't know why I was, I don't know. I, ju- I don't know why I didn't think of Spain as being a place where there would be a lot of paranormal activity. It's n- not that I thought there wouldn't be. I just didn't really think, it, 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 you know, I was kind of neutral on it. But it makes sense. I mean, there is so much history and a lot of bloodshed and a lot of extreme passion of different religious ideologies all fighting up against each other and you know it's just it it creates that energy where i it makes sense now that i think about it that you know there could be all sorts of stuff going on going on in spain absolutely but Man, what about that electronic fog? Oh, wow. yeah. I'm really looking forward to kind of learning more about that because I don't know. It's like I, I want I just want to know more about theories of the specifics of, you know, how it kind of works and stuff. Absolutely. So, Dylan, thank you so much for putting together just another killer episode. And thank you for doing it for the squad. Of course. Well, I'll tell you what, Maureen. Uh-huh. I got a list of names I wouldn't mind getting lost in the fog with. Oh, okay. Folks, give it on up for our top-tier Patreon subscribers. Of course, the Dream James Watkins, the Finnish Face Via Alunkvist, the Madman Marcus Hall, the Vivacious Vicky McHugh, the Tenacious Teresa Hackworth, the Heartbreak Kid Chris Hackworth, the Oh So Suave Sean Richardson, the British Bonebreaker Bex Martin, the Notorious Nicholas Barker, the Terrifying Taylor Lashmet, the Count of Cool Cameron Corliss, the Archduke of Attitude Adam Archer, the Sinister Sam Kiker, the Nightmare of New Zealand Noeline Vivilli, the Loathsome Johnny Love, the Carnivorous Kevin Bogey, the Killer Stud Carl Staub, the Firestarter Heather Heather Carter, the conqueror Christopher Damien Damaris, the awfully awesome Annie, the murderous Maggie Leach, the sir of sexy Sam Hackworth, the evil Elizabeth Riley, Lauren Hellfire, Hernandez Lopez, the maniacal Laura Maynard, the vicious Karen Van Buren, the arch nemesis Aaron Bird, the sadistic Sergio Castillo, the rap scallion Ryan Crumb, the beast Benjamin Huang, the devilish Chris Set, the psycho Sam, the electric Emily Zhang, the ghoulish Gert Hankum, the renegade Corey Ramos, the crazed Carlos, the antagonist Andrew Park, the monstrous Michaela Schur, the witchy wonder J.P. Weimer, the freaky Ben Forsyth, the barbaric Andrew Barry, the mysterious Marcella, the hellacious Kale Hoffman, and the nefarious Kristen Nowicki. Wow, we love all of you so much. Oh my gosh, our top tier Patreon subscribers. Thank you for all that you do for us. We love you so much. Thank you to all of our Patreon subscribers, though, as well. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank all of you for listening. And feel free to check out patreon.com slash creepstreetpodcast for some of that great bonus content and for your name to be able to be read off in that very, very wonderful list of people. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Please remember to like, rate, subscribe, share us on social media, tell your nephew about us or whatever. Um, or, you know, more likely tell your probably like your, um, you know, kind of like the older friend you have at work about us or something. Yeah. Um, and we really appreciate it. Citizens of the Milky Way, my name is Dylan Hackworth. I'm Maureen Bogey. Good night and goodbye. Bye.